Thank you. So my talk is going to be about um, what leads to, pro to progress. Um, the first thing I want to answer is what do we mean by, by progress? Um, now, um, I'm going to illustrate this with um, this picture here of the, a section of the so solar system. It only goes up to uh, Jupiter there. But there's some good and there's some bad news about our future. Now, the bad news is um, this. I hate to break it to you, but the sun is going to become a red giant and it's going to be too hot to live on the Earth. Uh, the good news is it's not going to happen for 7 billion years, so there's plenty of time. Um, we could escape uh, in, a, in a rocket and go and live on one of the moons of Jupiter, which would be in, in a habitable zone. That's as long as we survive that long. Of course, we might not survive that long. And in any case, when we get to Jupiter, we still need to treat each other nicely. Um, if we don't, then that doesn't seem like, like pr progress. So there's a scientific element to progress. There's technology, like the rocket, that might take us away from the Earth. But there's also a moral element to uh, progress. Um, we, we would need to reduce suffering. And actually, if we don't treat each other nicely, we won't re reduce the suffering. So there's science and, and uh, scientific progress and moral progress. So this got me thinking, is there something that underlies both of these things? Normally, people think science and morality are two very different things. Is there a style of thinking that um, leads to both of these, that underlies these? Um, well, I think there is and I call it critical open-mindedness. And I'm going to illustrate critical open-mindedness um, using um, my props here. Now, imagine you've got two different theories, theory A and theory B. These could be theories of um, two different scientific theories of global warming, for example, or they might be the views of the Palestinians and the, the Israelis. They might be the views of a married couple in an argument. Um, I used to argue a lot with my wife about who did the most chores. Um, we, we, we don't anymore on this, but uh, you could have, I do the most chores. No, I do the most chores. Um, well, my chores are harder than yours, and my chores are harder than yours. Um, now, open-mindedness, or rather closed-mindedness, is where you close one of these down and you're sure that your view is right. I know that I'm right. Open-mindedness is where you... Uh, keep both open, so you've got both points of view open. Now, what's critical open-mindedness? Now, critical open-mindedness is where you, you keep the theories open. You do think one point of view is better than the other, but you don't completely get rid of this other point of view, and you're prepared to switch, so there's a, a, a critical element to it. Now, does this style of thinking actually exist? Um, I'm going to give you an example of it from, from history. Um, from uh, Martin Luther and Erasmus. So these are two religious thinkers at the time of the Protestant Re Reformation. And what I want to illustrate to you is their different styles of thought. They were very similar characters in a lot of ways. They were both, as I say, they're, they're religious thinkers. Uh, they're both Northern Europeans. They were both trained as monks. But their attitudes of mind are very, very different. They had an argument about uh, free will, and they sent these uh, books to, to each other. Um, and it's a bit like the thing you might get on internet comments uh, pages now. Uh, Luther, he says, your book is so contemptible and worthless, although you write wrongly, I owe you no small thanks because you've confirmed my view. Now, um, Erasmus is a very different attitude. Even if I've understood what Luther discusses, it's altogether possible I'm mistaken. I merely want to inquire and not to dogmatise, and I'm ready to learn. So... Um, if I highlight these for you, um, you can see um, that there's a very different style. Luther on the left, this is very much what you get on internet comments pages, people saying you're wrong. Um, it's actually rarer that you get the style of er Erasmus. Um, he's the critically open style. He's saying, I might be wrong, I'm ready to learn from, from other people. So there you have an example of two religious thinkers. One is closed and one is, one is open. But what Galileo actually talked about in a great book, uh, 1632, Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, he compared these two theories, whether the Earth is at the centre or whether the Sun is at the centre. Um, and what he did is he was very open about the arguments for both sides. Although he was on the side of the Sun being at the centre, he realised that there were quite a lot of good, good arguments on the other side. And he did give a really good go at giving you arguments for both sides. Um, so there's a critically open-minded aspect to it. Now, you might think, well, we know 
that Galileo was right about the sun being at the centre. So shouldn't we be closed-minded now? Shouldn't we keep B there? You know, we're, we're sure about that. We know the sun's at the centre. Well, the thing is, Galileo wasn't completely right. He got quite a lot of things wrong. He thought the planets went round uh, in circles, and they don't. They go round in ellipses. There were better theories. Um, my next lovely prop here is my credibility thermometer of how uh, strongly you, you believe in a theory. Now, Galileo's theory may have been quite good at the time. There, there was reasonably good evidence for it. Maybe he was at 70%. It wasn't 100% correct. Um, uh, Newton's theory of the solar system was pretty good. He probably did maybe get up to 99%. His theory wasn't the, the best theory. Einstein's theory was better than that, maybe 99.5%. The point of my credibility thermometer, it doesn't go up to 100. Uh, you keep your options open for better theories. Um, now, one thing that Galileo did was he uh, considered the opposite view. Now, this is something that psychologists have looked at as a way of getting rid of bias. Um, now, there's a thing called my side bias, which you're probably all familiar with, which is that people tend to think that arguments that support their view are better quality. So, for example, if I support the death penalty and I read an article that supports the death penalty, I'm more likely to say, yeah, that was well written. That was a good argument. It happens in uh, sport as well. If you support a particular football team uh, and you're asked to judge the quality of the referee, you will probably say uh, the quality of the refereeing is better when it supports your team. What's interesting about my side bias is that it's quite hard to get rid of it. If you just tell people, look, there's this thing called bias, we're all biased, um, just try not to be biased. Try not to be biased in favour of your team. It doesn't really work. The only way that you can get rid of bias um, is you have to tell people to consider the opposite view. So you have to say, imagine you didn't support the death penalty. What would you think now of the arguments? Or imagine you supported the other team. Now how would you judge the quality of the, the referee? So, so this is a good example of seeing open-mindedness in action. Now, I We've talked about Galileo using this, but religious thinkers use it as well. And a real uh, master of it is uh, Jesus in Luke's Gospel. Now, I'm not a religious believer, but I am struck by the similarities with the, uh, how uh, Jesus is portrayed in Luke's Gospel and this sort of feature of open-mindedness. So in Luke's Gospel, there's a lot of parables that Jesus tells that are all about asking people to consider a different point of view. Um, one of the most famous ones is um, the Good Samaritan. Now, the Good Samaritan, everyone knows the story a bit, I think, but often people don't realise what it's about. Um, so I'll put it into context for you. So the Good Samaritan, the story is that a person is wounded, and you're assuming this is a Jewish person, uh, this is who G Jesus is talking to, Jewish audience, um, and three people walk by. The first person is a priest, he walks by, he looks at the wounded man, and he just walks on by. The second person is a Levite, who is someone of the priest class. He does the same thing. He looks at the man, and he walks on by. Um, the third person is the Samaritan. He looks at the man, and he has compassion on him, and he looks after him, he dresses his wounds, and he takes him to the inn. Now, the interesting, the whole point of the story is not just that, oh, somebody helped, the point of the story that you need to know is that the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. Um, they despised each other so much that the um, Roman historian at the time, uh, Josephus, recorded how the Jews destroyed the Samaritans' temple. And you also need to know that the, the parable is aren't, the story is, is told in response to the question, um, who is my neighbour? So Jesus says, you know, love your neighbour, and the disciple says, who is my neighbour? And he tells this story. So the point of the story is your neighbour is not who you think it is. It's the out-group person. The person you despise is your neighbour. He's asking you to consider the opposite. If you told the story now, you'd have to have, you know, it's the, the Jewish person who helps the Palestinian or the Palestinian who helps the Jew or the only person who helps you is the supporter of the other football team. It's, the whole point is, is that your neighbour is, is the out-group member. Um, so um, we've seen that critical open-mindedness, I'm saying it helps you to get closer to the truth. This is what Galileo's trying to do, compare different theories, get closer to the truth. 
You also see from sort of the example of Jesus that there's a kind of moral element to this as well as of asking people to sort of consider other, other views. And in fact, there's evidence from psychology as well that um, it does, critical open-mindedness helps to resolve conflict. Um, so this study from Sudfeld and Tetlock, what they did was a very interesting thing. They looked at international crises and they looked at how open-minded the uh, people who had to solve the crisis were by looking at their letters and their uh, diplomatic pronouncements and so on. Uh, and they compared the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 60s where uh, we averted nuclear war. It got very close to a nuclear war between America and Russia. They averted it. And the First World War, which we know ended in war. Um, and they found very interestingly that the discourse of Kennedy and Khrushchev and also the secretaries of state involved were incredibly open-minded in the sense that they had lots of options um, available and they were prepared to switch right up until the last moment. Um, by contrast, in the First World War, the statements of the leaders were very closed, very dogmatic, uh, no, no sort of uh, um, uh, no awareness of kind of shifting of, of, of point of view. So again, you have um, the open and closed um, aspect of this. Um, just to bring it up to date, so to today, you know, uh, examples of people being um, closed-minded or open-minded. And of course, people say things like this all the time. I've got an example of someone from the Donald Trump um, team, but people from all walks of life say things like this, you know, that they're correct 100%. Um, and you see it um, in extreme statements as well. There's no doubt that I should be doing this from, from a terrorist, let's say. Now, the, the problem with closed-mindedness, I'll go back to my um, thermometer here. If you fill this up to 100, as you can see, I only, I've only gone up to 99. I'm prepared to go to 99.99, etc. If you fill this up to 100, there's no room left for um, rational debate because you know you've got the right answer. You haven't left any room. Um, so how else are you going to change minds if you can't use rational debate? There's a danger that you might, it leads you to violence, or it leads you to sort of force, you have to force people. Um, you haven't left any room. In fact, the philosopher Karl Popper said, um, you know, critical reason is the only alternative to violence that we've discovered. It's the only way you can change minds without using violence. So there's a danger when you, um, there's a moral element to it. So what I'm saying is not only scientifically is it good to not be certain, but morally, um, it's, it's good as well. Um, now, I called my talk Question Everything, and you might wonder, am I really serious? Am I serious about questioning everything? What about the fact, you know, John Lambie, that's me, I'm standing here in Cambridge today. That's certain, isn't it? Should I question that? Well, it's possible I could be dreaming. Uh, I did have a dream last night about doing this talk, and everything went wrong. Um, but it felt, at no point did I think this is a dream. I wish I had thought that. Um, it seemed very, very real. So it's possible I could be dreaming. It's possible my memory is playing tricks on me. I'm not really in Cambridge. I went to Chelmsford and I, I can't remember. So I'm not saying there isn't truth. There is truth. There is a fact of the matter about whether I'm in Cambridge or in Chelmsford. But I should always leave a little bit of doubt that I can't be completely certain. And likewise, you know, what's the answer to 13 times 57? There is a right answer to that, but it's always possible I calculated it wrong. Maybe my calculator made a mistake. Maybe I, um, you know, again, my memory, when I looked at the answer and then I tell you the answer. Uh, so there is a truth, there is a fact of the matter, but um, we shouldn't always think that we're certain. We shouldn't go to the, the 100%. So I am serious about that. Now, how can we be critically open-minded? As I said, it, it, is a, it is a difficult thing to do. I mean, sadly, I mentioned the internet comments. I gave you the example of Luther and Erasmus. The actual style of Erasmus, where he says, oh, I'm ready to learn from other people, that's quite rare on internet comments. It's quite hard to find that. It's very easy to find the people that say, you're wrong. You've confirmed my view. Yeah, you would say that because you are prejudiced and, you know, I, I know that I'm right. Um, but, you know, what you have to do is consider other views. Um, and 
if you uh, don't think you're 100% certain, it's much easier to do that because you think, well, if I'm not 100%, I should consider other views because that's the only way I'm going to learn. Um, and of course, we need to live in a society which helps with this, that, that presents different points of view and that allows us to challenge authority, whether it's scientific authority or political authority. Um, so really, I had my, my question, which was, you know, what leads to progress? And really, the answer was, was there all the time, that um, you, know, you get rid of the question mark, um, question everything. It's what leads to progress. So, um, so I say to you, go forth and question everything. Thank you. Thank you.